Do you know if Mark Harris is in today? He is, and he's expecting you. Follow me. Okay. Well, good morning. Hey, welcome to Appleton Alliance Church online, but welcome. You know, I've got a very pertinent verse for you this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. He says, so then, let us not be asleep as others are, but let us keep awake. And I want to thank you for getting up this morning. I know you might be in your PJs, but we recognize too that that type of sleep is not what Paul was referring to here. He's referring to a, a spiritual sleep, a sleep that as believers, you and I are prone to. Now, throughout the pages of scripture, God has used things like what we're facing right now as his wake up call. His desire is that myself, that you, that we wake up, that we grow deeper in our spiritual life. He wants to transform us. He wants to renew us. And so our current series is Renewal, Lessons from a Pandemic, where we're taking a look at God's word, we're listening for his voice, and we're, we're seeking to answer this question, God, what do you have for us? through this pandemic, how can we be renewed? And so we're looking forward to uh, his word this morning. Now, before we get into worship this morning, let me mention this to you, because often our perspective is skewed. Sometimes we think that the people on the platform or the people on the screen, those are the worshipers. 
and we are the observers, especially if we're at home. Uh, but I don't think that's God's perspective. God's perspective is they are the worshipers, but so are we. Together, we are the worshipers, and He is the observer. And so today, as He listens, as He looks into our hearts, we, we, we hope, our desire, is that what He sees pleases pleases him. You know, it's been interesting since we've gone online that right now we have people from many states in the union who've joined together right now to worship with us. We've got people from several countries in the world right now who will be worshiping with you in just a moment. This is much bigger than your living room, right? And so as we, we worship, we need to know that we've gathered as his body here in the Fox Valley, but we've gathered as part of his body through, throughout the world. Hey, Mark. Oh, hey, Austin. We're ready to get started whenever you are, so. Great, we'll be right there. Okay, as we get ready to worship, would you stand with me and let's worship God with hearts of praise. Well, good morning from wherever you're joining us. Um, we're excited about today's worship. Uh, today's worship talks a lot about who God is and um, who we are in him how he orchestrates our steps and that there's not a lot to worry about in life when you let God take over. So I invite you to worship in that. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the way The same God who's never late working all things out it's working all things out yes i will yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy and all my days oh yeah I will Sing that again I count on one thing I count on one thing The same God That never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the way the same God who's never late is working all things out. It's working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand against, yes I will, yes I will lift you high. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will for all my days.
sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. Though we stumble, He will not let us fall. thank you that you let us into your family that you call us sons and daughters even when we don't deserve it God you made a way for us to be your son so that we could be together forever in heaven we just want to thank you for that God be with us in these moments let us not forget who we are and who you are we ask all these things in Jesus name amen COVID-19 has decimated economies around the world. Uh, Big business, small business, personal finance 
And so people have rightfully asked us, how has this impacted the church's financial standing? Well, my office is right next door to the office of our operations director, Bill Douglas. Bill's job is to keep us out of jail and keep us in the black. So let's ask him. Hey, Bill. I can hear you, Mark. Hey, Bill, the people are wondering how this has impacted the church's finances. Can you give them an update? Who are you, who are you talking about? Those people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the people in oh, the camera. Oh, okay, sure. I know, yeah, I know a lot of you are wondering about what's going on with the finances of the church. And as you might imagine, with everything going on, we have seen income drop. Um, about 50% of our income comes from people giving to the offering plate on Sunday morning. And when you don't have church, you're not passing the offering plate. The good news is a lot of you give online. That's helpful. And now that this thing is stretched out, many of you decided to send your donations in via the mail. And that's, that's really helping out. But but not surprisingly, our income has fallen a little below our expenses. We're working hard to bring expenses down, but we got a gap there. And, um, and right now, because of the Dare to Move campaign that came up a couple of years ago, uh, we're able to fill that gap with some cash reserves that we built from your donations during the Dare to Move campaign. So again, thank you for that. Maybe you didn't know that's how we we're going to use it about a year ago. I sure didn't know that either, but it's coming in really hand on out. We're really blessed by what you guys did. Thanks. Hey, Bill, why don't you share with them also how this has impacted our staff? Yeah, Mark, I, you know, I know everybody's worried about staff. You can't watch the news without being worried about that. We know people are getting laid off. We know people are losing their jobs. We know people are taking cuts in pay. So you got to wonder about what our people are doing here at Apple Alliance Church. Well, the good news is we're working very hard to make sure we keep everybody on the payroll. Um, uh, we do have a few people that have qualified for and chosen to take the programs that are offered by the government. And, you know, the CARE program allows people to uh, be at home with their families by taking emergency PTO and the Family Medical Leave Act allows them to be there where they need to be with their kids, uh, take them through school. And so we freed those people up to go do that. And that's a great program the government is helping us get through here right now. Uh, again, right now we're trying to keep everybody employed, everybody uh, some work to do. And you've probably seen that on Sunday. Think of all the videos and the online ministries that all of our ministries are doing. That's how we're doing that. We're keeping our people employed to do that. Hey, one more thing. Uh, how about our missionaries? We've got a lot of mercy ministries outside the walls of this church that depend on us. What about them? Hey, Mark, you know, that's the great news that's going on right now. In spite of the chaos around the world, in spite of what we just talked around finances and trying to keep people employed, we have been able to uh, send exactly the same amount of money to our missionaries around the globe and keep them where they're needed most to share the gospel. So again, that comes from the Dare to Move campaign, the fact that we've got funds built up, and we also committed to you as a congregation that that's where we're going to use our money for. That's the habit of impact in the world, and so we got to support our missionaries to make that happen. You know, the other thing we're doing, we're doing the same thing in the community. We committed to you that we would take your money and use it to have an impact for Jesus in the community, and we're doing that right now. So as people have financial needs, we're there to help them. And uh, again, you guys are making it happen. So what's the bottom line? Bottom line, yeah, hey, the bottom line is this. We got some challenges. I've told you that really our, our expenses right now are exceeding our income, but we're closing that gap. Good news is we've got some uh, cash reserves that are helping us make it through that. And all that's because you guys stepped up a year ago with Dare to Move and said, we're gonna have this church do big things, both in our congregation, in our community, and around the world. So I gotta say, thank you for that. We'll get through this. Hey, Bill. Oh, hey, Brian. You guys done talking about money and stuff? Yeah, yeah, we're just finishing up. Hey, let's get over and hear the message. Something that we're doing new right now is uh, we're having to be both parent and teachers for a lot of us. Um, it seems like every week there's something new that you have to do in light of this season and and the crisis we're in, there's something that is unfamiliar to us. And right now, the big one is we're recognizing that, um, unfortunately, because schools are starting to kind of say, hey, look, the rest of the year we're not doing anything. So parents are making peace with the fact that they're going to have to get their kids to the finish line of the school year. And I think collectively, that's why we all agree. And I think there's a petition going around to raise teachers' salaries to about $1.5 million per hour. 
and free coffee for life. But, <laughs> but uh, and we can all put some flame emojis on that and a lot of love and thumbs up. If you want to comment right now for your teachers, do it. Because I'm telling you, I'm not a teacher and I also don't have to teach my two-year-old because there she's two. But we do try to help her learn some things. And I've learned how difficult that is. It, not just because she's two, but because they're kids and you don't always know how it's going. Just the other day, I was trying to teach her um, about the different features in her face. So I was saying, Adeline, you know, show me your eyes. And she points to her eyes. Where's your mouth? Where's your ears? She points to those things. And at, all of a sudden, in the middle of what I thought was like a pretty good lesson, I thought we were doing fine. She all of a sudden like kind of seizes up. She stops breathing. She starts shaking. And she starts, you know, looking past me and she's not breathing. And I'm like, I stand up. I'm like, Adeline, breathe, breathe. Talk to me. What's going on? What's going on? She's just shaking like this. And I have no idea what's going on. I'm like, I'm at the point where I'm pacing around the, the, the room like, Adeline, breathe. And it was only a few seconds. Uh, but for me, it was like, you know, as a parent, you just feel like, what's going on? It feels like eternity. And she stops and she goes, dad, dad, muscles, muscles, muscles. And I'm, I'm like, this is, this is it. I'm never, I'm not doing this again because the <laughs> lost in translation, man, I thought I was like, she's, here she is, right? She is trying to show me her strength. She's trying to show me like, this is her strength. She's strong. She's healthy, right? That was the symbol for like what looked like to me a conniption. And I'm like thinking, you know, it's a medical thing going on. There's some sort of crisis going on. We had the same experience. And we had two completely different responses to it. And so I don't, I gave up on teaching uh, for the rest of her life. Um, but this is no different than I think people's response to this crisis. There are, there are people that are walking into this thing and they're seeing God do exactly this, renew. They're seeing him renew stuff. They're seeing this renewal of maybe even just the environment, you know, their values, their priorities are being reorganized in a good way. Their budgets are getting reorganized in a good way. It's trimming the fat. There's good things. There's people are seeing it, right, in, the, in this crisis. But at the same time, there's people going through it and stuff's not getting renewed. I mean, th- we've know, we know this about crisis, that even in, our, even in our past, in our life, we've gone through things or we've seen people go through things and, and one person goes through that thing and they come out the other end with a healthier or a, a greater relationship with their spouse. Somebody else goes through a crisis and it didn't. The marriage didn't get renewed. It didn't get stronger. And then they, they, you know, we, we wonder, why, what was the difference? They both had the same thing. They both went through crisis. Why did one go the other way? Well, this is, this is what we know about crisis. And this is what is true. Crisis doesn't automatically renew you. It's not, it's not like crisis does the renewal. Crisis reveals, crisis illuminates, crisis shows you who you really are in the first place. It comes out and then there's a moment, then there's a point where you can either do something with it yourself and try to fix it yourself. And, and then as Christians, we believe that actually we have the opportunity to take what comes out, what probably comfort was cooking all along inside of us, and we can give it, we can actually give it to God. And he's the one that renews. He's the one that heals. He's the one that fixes. What gets revealed gets renewed if we give it to God. And some of us, what gets revealed becomes more wreckage. And I just believe this. I believe right now, some of you are in this place where stuff's coming out and you're just right here. You haven't decided what you're gonna do with it yet, but it's come out and you're kind of, maybe you're tuning in for the first time because you're kind of leaning in, you're kind of looking upward and you're kind of seeking out the Lord like, God, is it you? Is it, you know, that's what sometimes happens is, is there's a bit of a renewal of interest in God because everything else is kind of quiet. You know, Psalm 38 puts it like this, that it's our brokenness that makes us more aware of God's nearness. David writes, God is near to the brokenhearted. And there's a lot of people right now. I'm just, I'm not gonna get up here and talk about this renewal stuff and not deal honestly with where you're at. I'm supposed to deliver truth in love and love means I'm thinking about where you're at. And I'm gonna be honest with you. Some of you are hearing this, you're seeing this and you're like, he's gonna talk about that right now? Like, that's not me. I'm I'm just broken. And I wanna encourage you that like in your brokenness, what happens often is God appears very near but this is what we know about God. Like he's near to you, whether you're fine or whether you're, you're broken, whether things are comfortable or uncomfortable. He's the nearest thing to you at any given point in your life. But here's what happens in brokenness. Things get quiet because things stop working. 
Things stop making noise in your life. And so here's what happens. You begin to realize the truth of something that's been there all along. Like God has been with you all along from the beginning to the middle and right now he's with you. And the, the difference is now you can hear him. Now you can hear him. You can realize he's calling you. He's saying, I got a plan for you. I can give purpose to your pain. You got to give it to me though. You have to give me what's being revealed in your life and I can renew it. And so just like a doctor, you don't go in and you don't say, hey, look, I read WebMD. So I know what I am dealing with. I'm here to just kind of confirm that you agree and then have you do the work. Uh, No, no, this is different. You have to go in, right? If you want something healed from God that's getting revealed, you have to ask him to lead, to take it, to do it his way, not your way. You have to trust God's way. And that one of the areas that I am convinced God is once wanting to renew in your life that he's already, you can already kind of see this happening is this, this focus that leaves ourselves and goes on to other people. I would call it selflessness. It's this selfless compassion. And I'm telling you on the back end of this crisis, because eventually like, you know, eventually, eventually we're going to get through this. Like eventually, whether it's, you know, the, the virus is just kind of, kind of, you know, spread and, and whatever we're going to have, whether it be vaccines or herd immunity, whatever. Eventually, it's not going to be around forever. I mean, nothing's new under the sun. Stuff comes and goes. Eventually, we're going to get through it. Eventually, we'll be back at a Packer game somewhere. We'll be back in here eventually, right? That's going to happen. On the back end of it, though, on the back end of that crisis and that pain, there's, there's sometimes there's a worse pain for you, and it's the pain of regret. It's going through something that hurt, and then wishing you would have done it different and knowing you could have. The reason regret hurts so much is it's a self-inflicted wound. Like stuff that happens to you is hard, but stuff that hurts that you know you kind of, man, I caused that one. That hurts. And I, I believe everybody in a time of crisis, they want to have stood up and made a difference. They want to have stood up and made a difference, been generous, been compassionate, been selfless in it. And I don't, I don't want God, I, I really believe I want God to re- renew that in your life. So let's let God define selflessness. Let's let God define what compassion is from his word today. And I want to do that because there's, I, I want to be honest with you, it's really easy for selfishness to masquerade as selflessness. That's a very easy thing to do. So let's go right to the, one of the first attributes of what true selfless compassion is from Jesus's words. This is actually Jesus talking in Matthew chapter six. So let's go to it. He says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others for you will lose the reward. You can go ahead and circle that from your father in heaven. Next, next slide here is when you give to someone in need, Jesus is talking, don't do it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. You, you know, reward again. And the last one here is, but when you give in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Be very vigilant about that. Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will, there it is again, reward you. It's kind of strange. It's kind of like God's like, listen, I want to make sure you get out of, <laughs> get something out of your giving. Like out of your selflessness, I want you to think about what you're going to get out of your selflessness. It's kind of a weird thing. And that's not what, exactly what he's saying, but he's obviously concerned and he wants you to be about what's going to happen, not just to the person you're giving to, but what's going to happen to your life when you lean into giving. He's obviously concerned about it. And we know from other passages in scripture, like there's nothing void and null if you give a gift and people find out about it or if you give publicly. That's not something that like nullifies. I mean, there's wonderful godly people and gifts and generosity and compassion that was given publicly in the Bible. That's not, it's not, that's not the point of this. But what giving secretly does is it stress tests, stress tests your reason for giving. And this is what's true about that. Your reason is your reward. The reason you decide to do something, that's your reward. Your reason for giving is your reward. And let me tell you something. If your reason is to get other people's attention, that's not a reward. I mean, if your if your success or your or what you think is is uh, what defines you is what other people think of you, 
you will always be thirsty for their attention. And if you live by their compliments, right? We know this, you'll die by their criticism. That's not a reward. So if you're gonna give and do something generous and it's because you want people to see and think of you as generous, that's your reward. That's, that's literally all you're gonna get. And that is actually, to be honest with you, that's not even a reward in and of itself. Because let me tell you something. If you're trying to get people to think you're okay or you're good or whatever, listen to me. God loved you long before they assessed you as lovable. Like, like you understand that. Like long before someone decided whether or not you're so generous that you're lovable, God loved you. God already decided you're worth loving. You were worth going to the cross 2,000 years ago. You don't need someone to assess you as lovable. Listen, God does not compare you to who you compare you to. So if you're trying to stack yourself up with your generosity, look, it's, that is not a reward. Why are you even trying to do that? This, this is the other uh, truth about um, the reward piece is that um, there's actually something better than even any, anything you can get from this world. There's actually something that is spiritually more significant and more rewarding. Let me tell you something. When you, when you give anonymously, what you're kind of doing is you're kind of saying like, God, that one was for you. Like that, that, what I just did, that was for you. Because you're not going to get anything. They don't know it was you. And, and what's going to happen when they, when they receive that gift? At some point, they're going, I have no idea where this came from. It's going to inevitably make them think, God, you know, is there someone out there? Is there someone out there looking, for me, looking out for me? That's what they're going to think. And that's the truth that God is. <laughs> and he's going, to be, get the, he's going to get the reward. So you kind of do it anonymously and go, that one was for you, God. And here's what's kind of crazy about that. He's going to get the credit for something that actually he owns anyway, right? I mean, like who, who gave him, who gave you the gift that you gave to that person or the, the generous amount of time or energy or whatever you gave? Who gave you the energy to do that? God. You're just, you're just managing it. So he's actually getting the rightful credit. And, and that is, let me tell you how rewarding it is, though. It's so rewarding when you can do something and, and in a way you know is totally for God. It's not for anything else. Here's an example of how rewarding that is. Um, secretly doing good things is, is like a superfood for your soul. Doing things for the Lord alone, like just for his glory, for him to get credit, it is, it is like superfood. Here's how I know that. Secret sin, you ever, you ever deal with secret sin? I have. You ever live two lives, double lives? Doesn't that hollow you out from the inside? Isn't that like just, uh, it's like a, it fillets you from the inside to live two lives, to, have, to deal with something that you know is wrong in secret. If you're sitting on the couch right now next to people you love and there is a, some sin in your life, something bad that is habitual and you're doing, but no one knows right now, like even as I'm saying that, it kind of like takes your breath away. You're like, this is miserable and awful. And let me tell you something, in the same way that secret sin, secret bad, secret evil, in the same way that hollows a person's soul out from the inside, I'm telling you, secret good, like secret generosity, secret things that you do just because you want to worship and bring glory and honor to God, there's something about it that God reward. He gives you his presence in a way that I can't really describe and it's better than money because we know money's not happiness. It's not like the reward is money. People have money all the time and they're not happy. This is, look, learn to crave the roar of heaven over the, the, the golf clap of humanity. I mean, just learn to crave. I mean, when you, what's the worst that can happen is, is like you end up giving, giving away so much, right? That really you're, you're out of some stuff and it's like you were doing it all for the Lord. It's like when you get, when you get before God, and you have this moment where you're in front of them. You're kind of going like, look, Lord, I, this was all for you. All of it was for you. Even the stuff that I lost that I needed was for you. This is the, this is the, this is the way I put it here. Do your best work in secret. I mean, how cool would that be if like you go to before the Lord at the end of your life and your best stuff, your best stuff, your, your best work of love and grace and compassion was for him because he got all the credit. Do your best work in secret. That's what I want to do. This is the, uh, one of the reasons why I, most of my, uh, and this isn't, I'm not going to do a sermon on tithing, but most of my giving in both time, energy, and, and money that I give, 
you know, the volunteer stuff that when I volunteer do things, most of it is goes through the church. And, and here's why it's because if I show up at something and I serve and do something, got my name on it, that's one thing, you know, people might be like, oh man, you're so generous with your time or your energy or whatever. But um, if I show up and it's got like a church on it, like people see the church as like the body of Christ on earth, right? In a good way. They're like, oh, that's a church. That's, that's God's people. Like I, lo- I love like hiding and eclipsing myself in that. So like most, I give to other organizations. I give even directly to people in need. I do it personally. I, we all do that, right? But most of it goes through the church. And that's partly because I just, I want to hide behind the glory and the honor of giving God credit for my compassion or anything I do that's, that's, that's selfless. So that's why I do it. Here's the next one. I want to give you this. This is Jesus' brother. This is James. Here's the next attribute. James says this. Um, it's a passage here. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anybody? This is kind of a, a famous verse here uh, for Christians, that last one, where it deals with the tension between work and faith. And, uh, and, and we know this, James talks about this, the whole Bible <laughs> talks about this, that faith is a gift. Like you can't earn that by your works, your deeds. Um, but what James is saying is that the deeds, the work is kind of the facts of the faith. Like it's the evidence for the faith. It's not saying it earned faith. I mean, if God saves, guess what? You didn't do anything for it. If God, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you can't save yourself. You couldn't work your way to that salvation. Jesus is the Savior. So we know that works don't save us. But what James is saying is it's the facts of the faith. It's the evidence of the faith. And this is what he says. This is an example. He actually give it, gives an example of the, this is the next slide here. Yeah, he says this. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing. Now, hang on. That's super common in the old, in, because the reality is, is there was, <laughs> there was a lot of people in need. In the ancient world, uh, not, there was the aristocrats or the kings and their family and friends that had a lot of stuff, and then everybody else had nothing. Okay, that's how, that's how it was. There was no thriving middle class in the ancient world. So they lived actually a lot like most of the world today. And it's hard for us to relate to this in America because we don't live like most of the world. If you don't know exactly how many articles of clothing you have in your closet right now, um, most of the world doesn't live that way. Um, you know, most of the world knows like I got this jacket and I got these shoes, I got these pants, and I share these shirts with the rest of my siblings. Like that's, most of the world knows exactly how many things they own. They don't have a closet full of, um, um, they don't have a closet full of clothes that they just, oh, I didn't realize these, I forgot to wear these this year, I'm gonna give them away to Goodwill or whatever. That's not how most of the world lives. Most of the world knows exactly what they have. And in the ancient world, if you want a shirt, you want a jacket that you're gonna wear to keep you warm, you probably gotta kill an animal for it or find somebody who can kill an animal and put that little fur thing together for you. It's, this is not like us out of surplus. So he says, suppose you see a brother or sister has no food or clothing. Here's what he says. And you just say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm. It's this wishing well, like eat well, I wish you well. That's basically what this in the ancient world was trying to say. Like I wish, I hope, my, my thoughts are with you. I'm thinking of you. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. <laughs> what good does that do? And then he says this, this is the next slide here. Faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It's dead and useless. Basically, there is no such thing as dead faith and alive faith. You either have faith from God, that's a gift that you didn't earn, you didn't do works for, that is producing useful things like generosity and compassion to other people selflessly, or you don't. And the kind of selflessness we're talking about here is stuff that's not out of your surplus. This isn't like out of things that aren't gonna pinch or hurt a little bit. This is stuff that honestly, it's gonna cost you something. And that's, that's the audience for this text is the, when he's talking about giving away things, doing something, he's talking about something that actually is gonna, co- it's gonna cost you. And real faith, the facts of real faith do that. And it's useful. It's not just useful to the person you're giving something to. It's useful for you. Like it's, it's good. It, there's a reward. That's what we talked about. That's what Jesus, Jesus talked about. There's a reward for it. It's useful for you and for the person. So this is maybe way, the way James would put it. Um, uh, start being the answer to your prayers. Start, start being the, be the answer to your prayers. Let me tell you something. Nowhere in the Bible does it say like, don't pray, like don't stop praying. Like we should pray without ceasing, like without ceasing, we should pray, right? 
Don't stop telling people you're praying for them. And prayer is absolutely the most powerful thing you can do. It's like the most, you're talking to God. Is there anything more powerful than that? So prayer is powerful. It's important. We ought to do it. But let me say this. What James is saying is if the reason you tell somebody like, I'll pray for your need, I'll pray for that. If the motive behind it is because you don't want to do the harder work of feeling the sacrificial pinch of compassionately and selflessly giving or serving them. Let me tell you something. Uh, That's called selfishness. (laughs) And don't you think God knows? Like, don't you think God knows? Like, that's why, that's why you just told that person you're going to pray for him. It's because that little nudge I gave you to do something about it, you don't want to do it. And and so here's what I'm going to say. is like, honestly, James is telling us God's response to that little prayer you just prayed is you. Go do something. Be the answer to the prayer. Okay, the last one I want us to think about here is that gratitude. Gratitude is fuel for our giving. Uh, This is so important. Let Let me go to the verse. It's in Romans chapter 12. Paul writes this. He says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Why give your bodies to God? Why give physically, like physically everything about me, my whole person, why give it to God in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this kind of sacrificial way? Because of all he has done for you. Other translations say in view. So focusing on in view of all that God has done for you, all of his mercies. Let them, let your bodies be a living and holy sacrifice. Basically, a living sacrifice is like a living killing. Be constantly living and killing your desires, your wants, your comforts. Uh, This is kind of the only sacrifice that's always trying to crawl off the altar, at least if it's me. Like, I'm always like, I don't want to do it. It's like, hey, get back on there. This is a living sacrifice in view or because of all God has already done for me. And then he says this, uh, this is the kind of sacrifice that he will find acceptable. And he says this, this is truly the way to worship him. Other translations say, this is your true and proper worship. What, What that phrase there, what he's saying is that to not do this, to not give your entire life as a living sacrifice to others, to God, to not do that is as stupid as it is wicked. Like, like, do you know, do you know how much God has done for you? Do you realize all that you have in Christ, the eternal security of being with God, his presence with you wherever you go? It's not just wicked to not worship him that way. It's actually dumb. You are wasting it. This is, this is just common sense to give and serve and live in a way that just sets yourself back here and gives to God and others. Um, I was shoveling my driveway uh, over the winter time, which is something that I do from time to time in Wisconsin. And uh, I got to the end of it. And as many of you know, you get to the end of your driveway, you kind of know the plow is going to come through and just put a nice big wall of snow up right where you just got done you know, shoveling it all. And so I had this little debate in my head and it kind of went like this. It was me talking to myself and I, which I do a lot. Um, And it went like this. Hey, um, I'm just going to push the rest of my snow on the end of this driveway that I have. I'm just going to push it in the street. I found out later that that's illegal. You can't, you're not supposed to do that. But I didn't know at the time. So I started to push all my snow into the street from the very end of my driveway because I'm like, you know, the the government thing, they're just going to move it down the road. And then I looked in my neighbor, like, what I realized is like the amount of snow that I'm piling into the street not only isn't the best for traffic, but uh, it was eventually going to get pushed down and actually make his wall at the end of his driveway just a little bit bigger than usual. And... uh, I, I was thinking about this, but I'm still doing it. I'm just shoveling all the snow out into the street. And uh, I had this moment where I said in my head, I just said, you know, it's not my problem. It's not my problem. And that's where like Jesus like rudely interrupted me. Like I, I was having, I didn't invite him to that, you know, meeting. And he just showed up 
with all his Bible verses, because that's how Jesus talks to people. He's, there's no audible voices. He just, that's weird. He talks to people through God's word, the things he's already said, Jesus's words. All the Bible verses came rushing back into my mind as if to hear Jesus just saying, hey, Bri, uh, you know what? Uh, wasn't my problem. <laughs> your sin, the mess <laughs> of your selfishness, and the depths of your depravity, that was, man, that, that wasn't my problem. But, um, you know, I didn't come into the world to condemn you for your problems and stuff. You know, I came into the world to save you. I made your problem my problem. That's what I did. I made it my problem. And uh, the truth is, is it was very expensive. It cost me everything. It cost me my life. And uh, I'm still, it still cost me a lot of grace still cost me daily forgiveness for you. And, um, and it'll, there'll be more to come, but it's expensive. And here's the thing, though, is like, um, I'm, because I not only conquered your world's problems, I conquered all the world's problems. I, I, you are gonna have, from, because now I'm with you, you will never have a problem that I haven't conquered and that I can't conquer if you let me have it. And I go with you wherever you go. So Brian, go out and find yourself some problems. Go out and make the snow in everybody's driveway your problem because here's the deal, wherever you go, I go with you. And I solve problems, I fix problems. It's me, not you, but I go with you. So make it your problem. That's what being compassionate is. It's looking at other people's problems and saying, it's not my problem, but I'm going to make it my problem now. So that's what it is. It's not about saying, how do I avoid and how do I retain and keep myself safe? It's actually about how can I think of other people above me, even if it's inconvenient. That's what it's about. Because here's the deal. We have in view of all God's mercies, in view of everything he's done, we're fools. We're not just, that's not just selfish and wicked. It's dumb, man. You have everything. Go make something your problem this week. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, man, what? I got kids. Like, don't I have to be a good steward of that? Like, you know, I'm a dad too, right? And, you know, I think about that. You know, my kids depend on me and they didn't sign up for, so can we be reckless with our compassion? You know, what about all those Bible verses that talk about like being a good steward? You know, what about that? And, and you're right. You are right. You need to, listen to me. If God gave you kids, you need to be a wise steward of that. There's no verses in the Bible that say be reckless and foolish. <laughs> There's none of that. You need to be wise. Be a wise steward of your resources financially. Make plans. Store up for the winter. They're, those are important principles that are in the Bible. But let me tell you something. If you go through this whole crisis, man, you go through this whole crisis and you in no way, um, do anything to think selflessly and compassionately about those that are vulnerable and in need or weak. I just, I want to tell you, you're going to give something to your kids and the people that you steward. You're, you're going to give something to them more than just financial, more financial security or, you know, um, maybe a little bit safer setting in your, in your world. You're going to give them more than that materially. You're going to give them some spiritual lessons. So I thought about it. I wrote down, like, what would Adeline get from her dad if all I did is think about protecting her and, and kind of like gripping tightly all these things. And I wrote them down. This is what Adeline would get from me if she watched this whole crisis go by and I just, I didn't really think about selfless compassion. Number one, she would learn this from her dad, that it'll be up to me alone to provide for my needs when I go into crisis. That's the lesson I'm gonna show her. It's up to you. You gotta just figure it out. She'll learn that family is defined by blood alone instead of the fact that God says that whosoever believes in me, I give the right to become children of God. It was his blood that actually made us his family. But she'll, she won't get that. She'll get family is defined by blood alone. You take care of your family first. She'll learn that seeking control as much as possible is how you deal with crisis. Grip tighter the things that are in your hands and not God. Just grip the things and, the, and whatever you have. Grip that tighter. And she'll learn this, that what comes to me is for me only. What comes to me is for me only. That's what she'll learn. Um, Jesus uh, says that, you know, if you really try to grip your life um, really hard, it's kind of this principle, you kind of end up losing it. He says this in Luke. 
And if worst case scenario comes, man, and you, you, lo- like you feel like, man, I'm losing so much of my livelihood, I'm losing so much of my lifeness, I feel life going out of me, what Jesus says is that at some point, actually, you're gonna realize the whole time I was saving it. You were, you were participating in my saving of those parts of your life. So even if the worst case scenario happens, Jesus seems to imply that it's actually not that bad. You see, even if you're not a Christian, um, I just pretend for a minute that, just say, okay, what if Christians are right? Just for a second, what if the Christians are right? Here's, if Christians are right, here's what we believe, that when you die, you'll be conscious before your creator. There'll be some moment where you'll have your wits about you and you'll be looking at your, your creator and your maker and he will address you personally for the first time audibly. That's gonna happen. And we, we believe that um, he's gonna talk to you, he's gonna address you in your life. And I, be, I don't know how long it'll be before that happens. Like if you're gonna kind of be conscious after you die for like five minutes before he talks to you. I don't know. You know, I don't know if it'll feel like an hour. I don't know if it'll feel like a long time. I don't know if it'll feel instant, but you will be conscious. Christians believe that. We believe that we will see and talk to God face to face for the first time when we die. He's gonna, he's gonna address us. And in that moment when you wait, like I don't know how long it is, but there'll be a list of things that are important to you in your head, I'm sure. While you're waiting with bated breath for what your creator is about to say for the first time to you audibly, there'll be a list of things that, are, that matter to you. And I promise you that at the top of that list will be whatever is important to God. <laughs> whatever is important to this, this being, this, this, the, the, the creator of the universe, whatever is important to him is gonna be at the top of your list, wondering that question. And I promise you, whatever's number two might as well not even be on the list. It'll be so far down when you're standing eyeball to eyeball with your creator. And the cool thing is, is God, actually Jesus, tells us how that's gonna go down. He kind of gives us a picture of how that's gonna go, if you've ever wondered. In Matthew chapter 25. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. The son of man was the term he used to describe himself. He said, all the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will be seated and and he will set, and it says, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And then the king, Jesus is referring to himself here because he's the one on the throne. The king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. These righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did, when, or a stranger show you hospitality? When did we see you naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for or to me. And I know this is the part where if, you know, if you've read it before, you're a Christian, you might say, well, you know, I know that those things don't get you into heaven. And you're right. You know, get, there's a long list of people that give generously. and do, it, it, Those things aren't what get you into heaven. Works don't get you into heaven. You're right. But if you're saying that right now, <laughs> to try to get you out from underneath the call on your life to give generously to those in need and to have selflessness and compassion for those in need, if that's why you're saying that, then I'm just telling you I would be concerned because let me tell you something, that's what's gonna go down when you're eyeball to eyeball with your maker. Do you really wanna just kind of brush that aside? In view of all God has done for you, why would you not wanna, why would you miss out on that? To be able to be there and to say, Lord, my best stuff that I did in life, anonymous, it was for you. I wasn't doing it for any other reward, all of it. And the prayer that you might pray right now by like, God, I, I'm, I've given so much away. I've been so compassionate. I've given so much away, but I'm in, I'm in really dire straits right now. I'm struggling right now because of this compassionate generosity. Let me tell you something. That problem you have right now, on that moment, 
the most important moment in your whole existence, while you wait for what God's going to say to you for the first time, that problem you're having, that prayer you might be praying right now because you gave all the things away and you were so generous, that problem is going to become your greatest blessing on the most important moment of your existence. Live for the moment, that moment. Live for that moment. And don't miss the chance for God to renew, <laughs> to pay one of the most important parts of your story and your purpose, not just in this crisis, but in this world. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray right now that you would begin to renew. You would begin to renew an urgency, a passion uh, to serve, to love, to give generously so you get all the credit. But God, be welling up in people that urgency only from the place in view in light of all that you've done for us. Lord, while the rest of the world gives because it's their religion, because it's the morally logical thing to do, because they feel obligated to do, Christians, Lord, I pray we would give because of all you've done for us. We would give because we have everything in you. That's why we give. So Lord, I pray that that would be true of everybody in, the, in their living rooms, in their homes, in their places of work, in the community. I pray that you would bring your presence and nearness in the midst of brokenness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is unspeakably good to be a part of his church, isn't it? And we're reminded of the words of Jesus when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell, much less COVID-19, shall prevail against it. And so we're continuing on with, with our plans to plant, establish a faith community in Hortonville this fall. And because of that, next Sunday, May 3rd, at 4 p.m. and 7 p.m., Pastor Brian will be hosting a public interest parties event. Well, he will be able to let you know all the details. And so let me encourage you to join him next Sunday at 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. on Facebook. Now, as we get into this week, just know a couple of things. First of all, you can contact the church office between 9 and noon to talk, pray with a pastor. Also, on our website, we have daily devotions that we want to let you know you can access as well. We call Connection Point uh, any day of, of the week. Now, just before you go, let me leave you with one thing. This week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord this week make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord this week turn his face to you and give you peace. See you next week.